I trust that that is your prayer, that God would be the center of your vision in the midst of all kinds of competing things that are competing for your desire, competing for your delight. Please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31. We are just working our way through the book of Genesis, and we find ourselves in this this chapter that really challenges and helps us to see how God is sovereignly working through a very imperfect man, working for his glory in the life of Jacob. Let's open in prayer uh, before we look at God's word. Heavenly Father, that is the prayer of our hearts, that you would be the center of our, our vision. And Lord, you know how easily we get distracted by so many other things. Often they're, they're good things, and yet nothing is good when it distracts us from you. And when we're distracted from you, we easily get overwhelmed with discouragement. We feel overwhelmed with life. In your word, the psalmist says, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So I pray that that will be the reality in our lives today, Christ. By your grace, may we have a growing awareness of your presence that increases our trust in you. Holy Spirit, open your word to us. Even though this was written thousands of years ago, and yet the implications are deep and obvious for our lives. Oh, I pray that you would help us to see God, our Heavenly Father, in the way that draws us to him in humble dependence and confident trust. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Who is for you? Who is on your side? I remember when I was in elementary school, at the beginning of every recess, we would pick teams, choosing sides for the football game or whatever we are going to play for the rest of recess. And it was very clear. When someone was chosen, they would stand next to the team captain with all of their other teammates. And for the next 15 minutes at recess, we were banded brothers battling together against the other team for that day's championship victory. Who is on your side in your life? Who is for you? As we're working our way through the book of Genesis, uh, we've been focusing on a man named Jacob. And at times, it would seem like Jacob has no one that's for him. It seems at times that everyone is against Jacob. His brother Esau wanted to kill him. He was a pawn in the hands of his wives, Rachel and Leah. His uncle Laban did everything possible within his power to cheat him, to harm him, to leave him with nothing. But when Jacob left his homeland, God appeared to him in a a dream. And God said that he would be with him. He would watch over him. He would bring him back safely to his homeland. So regardless of who was against Jacob, God had declared that he was for him. What about you? If you are God's child, do you have a clear and vivid awareness that God is for you? God is on your side. God is sovereignly working for his glory and your good. Now, oftentimes, as you look around at your life, circumstances won't seem to say that. Jacob could look around his life, and it would seem that circumstances wouldn't say that God was for him, the same as in our life, which is why walking with God is a walk of faith, trusting that he is for you, trusting that he is constantly working on your behalf. And that's why we need reminders. Beloved, we need reminders. We forget We forget that God is for us. We need the reminders that God is for us. And Genesis 31 is a clear reminder. It's a clear example of God being for his people, even in the midst of their struggles, even in the midst of their failures, even in the midst of their sin, God is for his people. So we will see in this passage, the central idea is that God is for his people in spite of their adversaries. God is for his people in spite of their adversaries. We will see two key uh, admonitions from this chapter. First of all, we will be called to follow God's leading, and secondly, we will be called to trust in God's provision. Let's look, first of all, follow God's leading. What brings us to this point in the, the book of Genesis? Well, we know if you've been with us, you're familiar with the story, uh, Jacob has left his homeland because his brother Esau is intent on killing him 
because Jacob deceptively stole the family blessing. Jacob fled to Haran, and he worked for his uncle Laban for seven years for his beloved Rachel. But when the time came, Laban deceived him, and it wasn't Rachel. And he married Leah. And so he had to work another seven years in order to marry Rachel. And, and last week, we saw the competition in what you could call baby wars, as the jealous competition back and forth between the, the two wives and the two maids. And, and then at the end of ch- uh, chapter 30, we saw last week that Jacob made an agreement with Laban, a business agreement. On how, and he was to keep all the dark and spotted goats and sheep in exchange for his working uh, for Laban. And in God's sovereign providence, Jacob's possessions grew exponentially. While Laban's were less and less because of the hand of God. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 31. Look at verses 1 to 2. It says, Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and for it belonged to our father, for he has made all his wealth. Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. So six years or so have gone by since Jacob and Laban made their agreement. And Laban's sons, who, were, who cared for the Laban's flocks, they were angry because from their perspective, Jacob had stolen their father's estate, which ultimately he had stolen their inheritance. They were angry, upset at that. But we know that it was God. God was sovereignly, God was providentially behind the scenes, orchestrating everything so Jacob's flocks were increased and Laban's flocks were decreased. And yet we see in this verse that it wasn't just Laban's sons. It was Laban himself. He had an increasing, a growing animosity toward Jacob. It says here at the end of verse 2 that his attitude was not friendly as it was formerly. Now, I read that phrase, and I thought, that's really odd, because if all of I looked at what Jacob's attitude toward Laban, I wouldn't consider that he was ever friendly uh, toward Jacob. And yet it's a comparative statement. Compared to what he was before, now he's even more upset. He's even more animosity toward Jacob. So what's happening here? Well, well, could it be that God is giving Jacob a kind of a divine shove, a divine nudge, a divine push? His brother-in-laws are against him. His father-in-law was increasingly antagonistic. Could this be God sovereignly nudging Jacob back to the promised land, to Canaan, where he ultimately belongs. Uh, Because we know that over the past six years, God's blessed him. His flocks have increased exponentially. He's had a lot of children. He has a big family. And he could have very easily just stayed there in comfort in the situation he was in. And yet sometimes the Lord just kind of gives his people a a gracious shove um, out of where they think they should be to out of where God sovereignly wants them to be. He pushes us out of our comfort. He pushes us out of our complacency. He pushes us out of other things that we like externally so that we'll actively pursue his will. And we see that in Jacob's life, and that often happens in, in our lives. But God didn't just direct Jacob through circumstances. God's going to speak to him. Look at verse 3. Then the Lord Yahweh said, God speaks to Jacob, return. Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. The time had come, and God spoke directly to Jacob. Yes, it was God's will that for a time, for a season, he had been out of his homeland. But now God wants him to, to leave that comfort, that temporary comfort, and go back to the promised land. God didn't only tell him what to do. God promised Jacob in this passage what he says. He says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Now, we saw that way back in Bethel. Remember 20 years before when Jacob left his homeland? God promised him, I will be with you. And now when it's time to go back, God gives him the same promise. I will be with you. And so Jacob sets in motion. He immediately sets in motion, taking and moving his family back to Canaan. So what does he need to do? He has has a big family. It's not just Jacob himself because he has a big family by this time. And he sent for Rachel and Leah, his, his two wives, so that they could talk in privacy. He has them come out to where he's with the flocks because he wants to talk to them very openly about what, he, what God has told him that they need to do. Look at verse 5 to 7. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field, and he said to them, 
I see that your father's attitude, that it's not friendly toward me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me. He's changed my wages 10 times, however God did not allow him to hurt me. Verse nine, thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. Jacob knows what he intends to do, but he needs to convince Rachel and and Leah that it's best for them to depart Haran and move the family back to to Canaan. And he tells them, he says, you know I've worked hard. He says, you know I've been diligent. I I have been a faithful servant. I've done what was expected of me. Uh, And yet he says, your father has been completely unfair. Your father's cheated me time after time. He's he's changed my, my wages so many times. And so on the one hand, Jacob wants to show them that their father has been unfair. He wants to show them that Laban now looks at them very unfavorably. But Jacob also wants to paint the other side of the picture. He doesn't want to leave them there. He wants to help them to to see. He doesn't want them to fear that they're in a hopeless situation with no future. So he emphasizes that God is ultimately the one in control of all this. God is sovereign. God was for him, and God had protected him, and God had provided for him and watched over their family. You see in this passage very clearly that that Jacob credits the Lord. He doesn't say it's because of me that our family is blessed. He says ultimately it's because of God that our family is blessed. Now in many ways, this is a different Jacob than the Jacob we saw last week. Actually six years ago, that's what last week was, six years ago. Because six years have, have passed. Because remember last week we saw that he was completely passive. All through those baby wars, he's just, he's not showing any leadership at all. And yet time has gone by. God has been sanctifying Jacob. And so we see here, and he'll go back and forth, even in the future, but right here we see Jacob is spiritually leading his family. He's directing them. And in order to convince his wives that they need to to leave, they need to leave Haran, they need to go back to his homeland, he points them to what? Not to his wisdom, not to his ideas, Jacob's not saying, trust me, I know this is a good idea, I figured it all out, this is the best way for our family to go. He doesn't say that. What does he point them to? He points them to the character of God. He points them to the character of God. He's calling them not to trust him, he's calling them to trust Yahweh, the God who had watched over him, the God who had watched over their family, even though their father had tried to to damage their family. And then, so he, can, he explains all these details to them, but Jacob leaves the most conclusive, convincing reason to the very end of what he says to them. Look at verse 13. He told them what God had said to him. God said what? He's, he's saying this to Rachel and Leah. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. What was Bethel? Well, 20 years before, Bethel was the place where when Jacob left his homeland, that's the place where he saw that great vision of the angels ascending and descending. That's really where Jacob came into a a personal relationship with the God of the universe. He said, that's the God that appeared to me then. And that God watched over them all, all that time, that 20 years. He said, that God will watch over me now. He's saying, this is the God that is calling me, calling us to leave the comfort, to leave the friends and family that we know here. This God is calling us to leave. So if Jacob's wives weren't convinced yet, this is the clinching reason. He calls them, God has told us we must go. We must go. Now, how are they going to respond? You think about Jacob and Leah, and they would have been comfortable. Um, they had grown up in Iran. All their friends and family that they knew were there in Iran. That's what they, they knew. So what are they going to say? How are they going to respond? We know as we've looked last week, and even as we look ahead, there are some definite situations where these women struggled. They wrestled. Um, and yet, look at their response here in verses 14 to 16. Rachel and Leah said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we we not reckoned him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Surely all the wealth which God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. 
This is amazing. Particularly as you look at this, as you look at this in uh, next to what we just saw last week. Last week, these women were fighting constantly with each other. Jealousy, conflict. And yet here, it actually, it actually says, Jacob and Leah said, uh, it's together. In a sense, they spoke with one voice. They are united under Jacob's leadership and, what, and they're affirming what Jacob has said. So, and also, and they continue on. It's kind of like a, a court comes off and, you, and Jacob gets a vitriolic vent session about dad. Uh, and it's not just 20 years, it's many years. Uh, first, they said, you know what? We have no inheritance from our father. We have nothing. He's taken everything. We have nothing uh, from him. Uh, he ba- they basically say, he sold us. He sold us to you, but he sold us, and he's consumed all of that price, all that work that you have given. He consumed it for himself. They even said to our father, we're like a foreigner. We're like a stranger. He, he has no love for us. He has no care um, for us. He's not going to provide for us. And, and they had seen. They had clearly seen that displayed in, in Laban. And so without hesitation, they agreed. They said, yes, we will follow you as God is leading you. We will follow God's hand of providence because we agree that it's right. It's right. It's what God would have us to do as a family to go back. So look at verse 17 and 18. Jacob responds. Then, man of action, Jacob arose. He put his children and his wives upon camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property, which he had gathered. And that's a lot. He, his acquired livestock, which he had gathered in Padadaram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Now, as you look there, um, Jacob is not stealing anything that's not his. Because it's very clear. Remember, we saw last week, it was very clear what was Jacob's and what was Laban's. There's nothing that Jacob steals, uh, nothing that he takes uh, that is not his. He deserves it by rightful ownership. And yet, if you look at verse 20, you had a couple of verses. The text specifically says that he did trick Laban. He did trick Laban by, by not telling him in advance that he was going. Uh, we know that Laban was three days away by Laban's own choice. Remember, he separated his flocks by three days, about 50 miles away. And so Laban doesn't find out for three days that Jacob has fled with all his family and all his possessions. Now, something else happens here, and that's Rachel. What does she do? She stole her father's household idols. Now, keep in mind that this family, Laban's family and and the extended family here, um, even though we see them talking about God, ultimately, they're idolaters. Book of Joshua talks about this household were idolaters. And so she steals uh, Laban's household idols. We We don't know why she did this, uh, these were valuable. They probably were made out of precious um, metals of some type. They were, they were valuable. Um, obviously, we're going to see next week that Laban believed they were very, very important. Uh, it's going to be right in the middle of his being very upset. We'll see that later on in this passage uh, as we see when Laban chases them. Um, but we don't know exactly. But it's ironic that Laban's, Laban worshiped gods that could be stolen. Laban worshiped gods that could be taken by a human. And yet Jacob is worshiping a God that is all-powerful, the God of the universe. Now, why didn't Jacob tell Laban he was leaving? Yeah, he he did. He did trick Laban. You you can't get around it. But think back in reverse of the 20-year history of their relationship. It's not hard to understand why. Laban has cheated Jacob again and again and again, over and over again. So in this situation, when it's going to be kind of the, this is the final situation. This is the, the goodbye. Um, Jacob has no doubt that Laban would try to take advantage of this situation. He would have le- legitimate concerns that Laban would probably do worse. And we're going to see when Laban chases him, it's pretty obvious that why um, Jacob did this. And so Jacob and his family, they, they packed up everything, take all of their vast possession, they move out as fast as they can uh, toward the promised land. And we're going to see how Laban responds to that. But what are some implications from this first section of of Genesis 31. I think a a very obvious implication that was missing last week that we see in this passage is spiritual leadership. And particularly an aspect of spiritual leadership that would say that spiritual leadership focuses on God's character. Spiritual leadership focuses on the character of God. 
You may look at this chapter and say, is this the same guy? I mean, Jacob seems to have made a major step in spiritual leadership, particularly he demonstrates the quality that true spiritual leadership focuses others on the character and the work of God. True leadership focuses on, spiritual leadership focuses on the character of God. Spiritual leadership isn't about handing out ultimatums. Spiritual leadership isn't about getting or forcing your own way. Spiritual leadership, leadership isn't about demanding what you want. This passage tells us spiritual leadership is about helping others to see the character of God. And out of that, they can respond in a way that glorifies Him. So in the church, in the home, in all aspects of your life, the most important way that you influence others is to help them take their eyes off their circumstances and focus on our great and awesome God. And whatever role that you have, and whatever responsibility that you have to, to influence others, to, to lead others, the most important thing that you can do is to focus people to see our great God because that's who we lose sight of. That's what we lose sight of. The circumstances seem so big and we need to help others see the character of God. Husbands, fathers, are you helping your wife and children to see God in the midst of all of life's circumstances that come through your family? Parents, no matter what age your children are, are you helping them, no matter what their age is, to see God, to see how God and who he is relates to the situation that you're in the middle of? In the church, for all of us, as we are seeking to help each other, as we are seeking to encourage each other, as we are seeking to counsel one another, as we are trying to help our brothers and sisters in Christ to, to live for the glory of God, the most important thing that you can do, and you say, I, I don't know what, I don't know how to help this person. You can know that if you will help them look and see the character of our awesome God, you will help focus them in a way that will bring him great glory. So in every situation, no matter what situation you find yourself in the middle of, the greatest way that you can influence and help someone else is to help them see the character of God in a sense, to, to peel back the blinders of circumstances, to bring the word of God to bear in their life, which declares the glory of God so that they can see God in every situation. 20th century Scottish pastor Oswald Sanders said, quote, we can all see God in exceptional things, but it requires the culture of spiritual discipline to see God in every detail, unquote. And that's what spiritual leadership does. It recognizes, it realizes that, that there is the character of God that has relevance to every situation, whether great or small. Love of God is in every detail of your life. God is in every detail of the lives of the persons that you love, and, and he wants you to influence so that you can lead them for his glory by pointing them to the character of God. And here's the amazing thing. We see this in Jacob's life. As you point people to the character of God, guess what happens to you? God teaches you all the more. That's what we see in Jacob's life. It's almost as he is pointing his wives, as he's pointing them to the character of God, he himself is, is growing in his own understanding, his own grasp of the character of God. And so as you point others to the character of God, he will grow you. When you're in a place of spiritual leadership, and most of you are here, most of you are in some way in a, in a role of spiritual leadership, uh, spiritual influence. Don't just hand out ultimatums. Don't just tell people what to do. Um, help that person, whether a child or an adult, a young person. Help them to see God for who he really is and why you can trust him. That's what Jacob did that ministered to those that he was leading. And that will make all the difference. That will give the people in your life something for them to aspire to, something for them that's worthy to follow. You know, another implication from this passage in that God's word is our primary guidance. And although you would say, well, circumstances are obvious. Of course, Jacob, leave. It's obvious. He doesn't like you. Your brother-in-law hates you. Just get out of there. But that circumstances weren't the primary issue. What was it? God's word. God said. God told him. That's true for us as well. It's not... Uh, 
primarily circumstances. It's God's word. It's his revelation. Uh, God doesn't appear to us in dreams and visions. Why? You don't need dreams and visions because you have this. They didn't have this. They didn't have the word of God that proclaims God's will for us. No, not God's will in the specifics of your life, but God's will overall. And as you understand God's will overall and you see him for who he is, God will lead you through the specifics. So we need to be those that lean deeply into God's word consistently, daily, as we are wrestling with how we should lead or what we should do, that we would look carefully and thoughtfully into God's word to become people of the book because we long to see God and who he is and how he would have us live. May we be students of his word so much that it informs every action, every thought, and everything that we say for his glory. So we see in this first section that a call to follow God's leading. God called Jacob to follow, and Jacob follows. Because the overall theme here is that God is for his people in spite of their adversaries. We're going to look next and see that Jacob has an adversary, someone who's not very happy at what has happened. So we'll see how we must trust God's provision. So they have a mixed group. Jacob has a mixed group of men and, and women and children. They're not, they're not very old. Jacob's sons are not adults at this point. They're young. Many of them are young. Uh, you know, at the oldest, probably eight or nine and, and down from that. So there's, there's children. There's lots of flocks. There's lots of servants. Uh, and so they, they get a head start, but they can't move very fast. Uh, we read that it's at the time of shearing. So, so uh, Laban and all his sons are away shearing the sheep three days away, probably about 50 miles away. And so by the time Laban finds out, Jacob has a, and his entourage have a three-day head start. So look at verse 22 and 24. One was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled. So someone has to travel three days to tell him, right? And then still he's got to make up that time and then catch up to Jacob. It's a long time. When it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, then he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him a distance of seven days' journey. And he overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. God came to Laban, the Aramean, or the Syrian, in a dream of the night and said to him, Be careful, be careful that you do not speak to Jacob either good or bad. And so uh, Laban is very upset. That's an understatement. Uh, Laban and his men, they, and notice it says kinsmen. There were no women uh, in uh, Laban's group. Uh, it was his kinsmen. They, no doubt, were armed. They're ready to cause problems. He caught up to Jacob and his entourage in the hill country of Gilead, just east of Canaan, across the Jordan River. So they've, uh, Jacob has actually traveled a long ways. He's very close, getting relatively close to the promised land. And Laban had harm in mind. At least he wants to intimidate them. At minimum, he wants to intimidate them. And so God has to intervene, and God does that. God intervenes. God speaks to Laban. That doesn't mean Laban was a follower of God. That doesn't mean that Laban knew God. God has a message uh, for Laban. And what he tells him, he warns him, don't say anything good, don't say anything bad. You say, why wouldn't he tell him to say something good? why, Why wouldn't he encourage him? No. What he's talking about here is don't say anything good like make a sweet deal like he did before, six years before, and get him to go back uh, to uh, Haran. No, don't say anything good. I promise that if he'll come back, I'll, I'll give you more stuff. But also don't say anything bad. Don't curse him. Don't say anything evil. Don't threaten harm. I'm going to destroy you if you don't come back. The basic issue is don't say anything good or bad to influence Jacob to come back. Because God is saying, I intend for Jacob to go to his land. Look at verse 26 to 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, this guy's a great actor. What have you done by deceiving me? Carrying away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee flee secretly and deceive me? And did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with joy, with songs, with timbrel and with lyre. And did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly. It's like the machine gun barrage. I mean, Laban starts out and he just brutally attacks Jacob with a litany of absolutely unfounded accusation. What's the first accusation? You kidnap my daughters. You kidnap my daughters forcefully. But Jacob's worked 14 years for his daughters. And 
Leah and Rachel were glad to leave Laban. He didn't kidnap them against their will at all. And then Laban goes into the doting grandfather mode, which is a complete act, totally. He mournfully complains that he would have had a going away celebration. I wanted to have a party uh, for you, to send you away. You can hear his whimpering, his sniveling when he said Jacob had cruelly robbed him of the opportunity to kiss his children and his grandchildren goodbye. This guy should get an Oscar for how he's acting here. Why? Because his daughter has just said, we feel like foreigners. We feel like foreigners. Dad doesn't love us. Dad could care less about us. He, he, wants, he wants, he's disowned them. He's, he's treating them like chattel where he's just using them for him, his own desires. Look at verse 29 to 30. He continues. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. At least he gets it right, what God said. Now you have indeed gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? So when the heart-tugging approach doesn't work, Laban begins to threaten. Now his threats, what he says here, totally shows that what he just said was hypocritical. Because he says, I could harm you. I could destroy all of you. Wait a minute. I thought you were a doting grandfather who wanted to kiss all your children and grandchildren, yet you say, I could destroy you. you God won't let me. It makes no sense. He's, he's showing his heart here. But then what's the final straw? The final straw here is that he accuses Jacob. He accuses him of stealing his household idols. Now, it's, it's obvious from the text that, that Jacob has no idea. He doesn't know that Rachel has done this. Now, we know that was wrong. What Rachel had done was absolutely wrong. And Jacob, he, he is so confident of his family's innocence. What does he say? He says, if you find someone that's stolen the family idols, bring them out of it, we're going to kill them. We're going to kill them. He has no idea that it's his favorite wife um, that has actually stolen the household gods. So he says, go for it. Go through all my stuff. And Laban does it. He literally sifts through everything of, of uh, Jacob's things, except Rachel. Um, she had hidden them in a camel saddle, which she was sitting on, and she just said, well, I, I'm unable to get up. I'm, I'm disposed. I can't, I can't get up in that. And so I'm surprised, actually, Laban doesn't push her off, but he doesn't, and so he never finds uh, the household idols. Well, Jacob hits the roof. Look at verse 36 and 37. Then, then, Jacob became angry. And contend with Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, and this is all within a very angry voice, what is my transgression? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Though you have felt through all my goods, what have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen so that they may decide between us two. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. Jacob says, I'm no thief. And that's true. He hadn't stolen that. Uh, but he says, no, I, I'm no thief. He says, you chased me like a, a common criminal. You've searched through all my possessions in a most demeaning way. This is very demeaning for to have a, a father-in-law go through all of his possessions. Show me what you found. If I'm what you say I am, put it out here where everyone can see, and we'll see whether your claim is legitimate or not. Now, obviously, Jacob has no idea um, that Rachel has actually done this. And so after his, after, uh, no, he can't do that. Laban can't pre pre present anything. Uh, Jacob, he uncorks 20 years of frustration in what he says, what he says to, to Laban. He, he rehearses the, the painful two decades that he's been with Laban. He says, Laban, I've been a faithful servant of yours for 20 years. I've sacrificially taken care of your flocks. If anything was killed or, or maimed or stolen, I bore the brunt of that. He says, I was out in the cold. I was out in the heat. I had many sleepless nights caring for your flocks. But ultimately, even in this section here, Jacob doesn't take credit for himself. Jacob knew there was only one reason for the circumstances of his life. Look at verse 42. Because he brings God into the equation. He says, God, my God, if the God of my father the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been for me. There we see that key phrase, for me. Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed, irregardless of children, grandchildren. No, you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, so he rendered judgment last night. In other words, last night, Laban, when God appeared to you, God, when God spoke to you, that was God's judgment. God was speaking 
And Jacob points to the character of God as the ultimate answer. He says, Laban, God was for me. Yes, you were against me with everything in you, but God was for me. He bypasses all of Laban's rhetoric, hypocritical rhetoric, and he says, if God wasn't for me, you would have sent me away with nothing. But he knows. He knows that Laban has no concern for his children. He's demonstrated that. Laban has no concern for his grandchildren. He has stolen everything. He would have sent them away empty-handed. But Jacob declares, Laban, this isn't about us. This isn't about a human altercation. This isn't about a human disagreement. He says, God has seen my predicament and rendered judgment. And Laban can't counter that argument because that's the clincher. It's based on the character of God because the night before, God had clearly rebuked Laban, obviously, and supported Jacob. So Laban can't do anything. He can't fight against Jacob. He can't take his things. He ultimately can't say anything else. So what's he left to do? Well, the best we can do is to have some kind of... uh, some kind of a, a peace treaty, a peace agreement. Look at verse 44. So Laban speaking, he says, So now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So if you look at the text, what do they do? They, they gather, gather a pile of stones as a, as a memorial, as a visible representation of the, of the peace treaty, of the, the covenant they're making with each other. Look at verse 48 and 49. Laban said, this heap or this this pile of stones is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it's named Galid and Mizpah. For he said, may the Lord, Yahweh, watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. Now, this little phrase at the end that you see in verse 49 is often called the, the Mizpah blessing. If you did a search on this, you would find that this blessing, it's, it's often found on, on plaques, it's engraved in wedding rings, it's uh, painted on walls, it's embroidered on pillows as a blessing between people, a sweet blessing between people that are separated from each other. May the Lord watch between me and you when you're absent one from another. Really? No offense intended, but are you serious? This isn't the kind of blessing that you'd want because God's word is meaningful and legitimate only in context. This little phrase doesn't mean anything if you ignore the context. What's the context of Genesis 31 to 49? This is a covenant between two enemies, not two friends. They hate each other. They don't trust each other. That's why they're making this. Look at verses 52 to 53, it's very clear, it expands it. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness. By what? That I will not pass by this heap to you for harm. You will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. They are making this covenant. They're calling on God to be witness because they don't trust each other. They, they, they're making a covenant that, that neither of them would pass this pile of stones with the intention to harm the other person. And, and both of them were concerned about that real possibility about the other guy. And that's what this is, is all about. They clearly, they don't want to ever see each other again. They don't. Uh, this isn't a reconciliation. It's not a reconciliation. This is just a truce, okay? I'm not going to destroy you. That's what this is all about. Look at verses 54 to 55. Then... Jacob offered a sacrifice. You see Jacob's angle. He's, he's, this is underneath the war. Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain. He called his kinsmen, his family, his servants to the meal. They ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. So we see Jacob here. He offers a sacrifice. This is, this is all about the Lord. He knows the Lord is in the middle of this. The Lord is, is for him. So he is praising God for God's gracious provision for him. And what's happened here, in God's sovereign providence, Jacob is finally free. He's free after 20 years of servitude to this wicked, deceitful man. This is the last time you'll see Laban in the Bible. He'll be referred to, but this is the last um, description of his life. He's done uh, with him. God has used him as the anvil upon which he sanctifies Jacob. And now God is going to bring Jacob back to his homeland of Canaan, which he promised him 20 years before. 
when Jacob had his dream at Bethel as he's fleeing from Esau. Now we'll see next week he has another enemy. He has to face Esau next week. Next week we'll see that he's between a rock and a hard place. He has Laban behind him with this covenant not to return back there and he has a brother in front of him who wants to kill him. But that's next week. So what are some implications from this? I think an obvious final implication is, beloved, we need to trust God's sovereign providence. Last week, we saw Jacob relied on all kinds of human manipulations, some very crazy things that Jacob had done. But at the end of the day, we see particularly in this chapter that Jacob realized he could only rely, he could only trust in his sovereign, all-powerful God. This is a stretching process. This is a growing process, which God takes all of us through, where God was sanctifying Jacob. But in Genesis 31, Jacob clearly gives God credit completely for what happened in his life. What about for you? Are you trusting in God's sovereign providence working in your life? Even using the the evil intentions of other people, even using your own mistakes and failures to accomplish his will for his glory. Where is God growing your faith? Where does God want you to more fully trust him? Now some here, uh, if this story is about you, you would be on the Laban side of the equation because you don't know God. You don't know Christ. Uh, And the call of this passage for you, if you don't know God, is to come to Christ, to believe, that trust, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all who would believe in him, to come to Christ in faith and repentance, Because you can never know God on your side. You can never know that reality unless you come to Christ in the gospel. Because that's the greatest way that God is on our side. But if you're a believer, you're a believer. Um, The call of this passage is for you to trust God. Sometimes we think that God wants us to do great things for him. No, God wants us to trust him. God wants us to trust him. And what area of your life is the primary work of God to stretch your faith? Where is it? What is it? For God wants to stretch your faith. He wants to grow your dependence on him. God was doing that in Jacob's life. It was often very painful because he didn't cooperate very well. How are you cooperating with God's sovereign working? So we see in this chapter that God is for his people in spite of their adversaries. We see the call to follow God's leading. We see the call to trust God's provision. Who is for you? Who is on your side? Uh, there are maybe times in your life where you're completely overwhelmed. If you look at circumstances, you may be like Jacob in this situation. Say, no one, no one's on my side. People want to kill me. Probably not if someone literally wants to kill you, but people want to harm me. Or circumstances just seem to be going against me. Maybe you're completely overwhelmed. It doesn't feel like anyone is for you. But you can know that God's word declares that if you are his child, God, the God of the universe, is for you. He is completely for you. You say, how can you know that for sure? When you doubt that, when you struggle with that, how can you know that for sure? Romans 8, 31 to 32 tells you how you can know that for sure. But then shall we say to these things, here it is, if God is for us, there it is again, if God is for us, who is against us? How can you know if God is for you? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Beloved, Christ hung on the cruel cross as the most vivid demonstration that God is for you. God sent his one and only son to, be, to die on the cross in your place so that you could be reconciled to him. So even if every circumstance in your life is a disaster, even if every person in your life seems to be against you, God declared 2,000 years ago by sending his son to die on the cross in his place that he is for you eternally, forever. Therefore, you can trust him. You can depend on him that no matter the adversaries, no matter the circumstances, God is for you. He is working on your behalf for the glory of God and the good of your life. Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. How would God have you to consider your perspective on him being for you? Maybe there's some situations in your life where you're doubting that. Maybe there's some circumstances in your life where you're you're struggling to believe that. How would God have you to consider what his word says about him being for you?
Heavenly Father, it amazes us that we see how you work with Jacob and then how you work in our lives, that, that you are for us. You are not for us in a way that would merely give us all the things that we um, would want humanly. We see that obviously in Jacob's life. Uh, and yet you are for us in a way that would give you the most glory and would be the best for us. And so I pray for each of us here that, that we would take our confusion, we would take our struggle to trust, and we would take it to you and, and know that you are for us in a way that will display you. When we fear, when we're overwhelmed by circumstances, remind us of your character, that you are working on our behalf for your glory and our good. In your name we pray. Amen.